So just uh, for introduction, I just wanted to add a little pin to last week's sermon. We, Peter there talks about our freedom, that we're called to freedom. And that freedom is not a political or, uh, or earthly freedom, it's a spiritual freedom, a freedom of mind and heart, and a, an ultimate freedom, that we are ultimately free from all things because we're the children of God. But for now, God commands us to use our freedom willingly to submit to the structures in society and in the home that we are in. Um, if you were born into the house of a great Lord, um, you would be, from the moment of your birth, owner of everything. Everything would be yours, the inheritance. And yet, if your great Lord of a father was a good father, he would raise you up in discipline and training, and you would be under tutors, and it would be a difficult life. It wouldn't be an easy life. And you would be raised and trained in such a way so that when you stepped into your inheritance, you would be able to handle it well. And there's something like that in the Christian life. For now, we are under the tutors of the spheres in, the, in society that we're under. Last week we saw we submit to the civil authorities. Today we're going to see that we submit, this is going to apply to the workplace for all of us. And then the next few weeks, we're going to see submission in the home as well. And that submission is not a submission because we're terrified of being punished. It's a submission that we are willingly doing out of that freedom of sonship. That we are heirs of all things. And so now we use that freedom to willingly submit and honor those over us. And God blesses that. He commands it. And it brings about gospel fruit. In other words, we don't come up like Billy Madison. He had to go back to school. So. so the Christian life is difficult. It's a difficult thing. It's not necessarily a life of privilege and ease. But because our Father is a great Father, He trains us well. And that's what these passages are all about. Okay, so coming to this passage today. Uh, we're going to ask four questions. I know I'm just on the questions. I can't get off of them. So that's what we'll do. Who, what, why, and how. So who? That's servants. Speaking of servants, so who's that? What? What he wants servants to do is to submit to those who have authority over them. Why does he want them to do this? Because it is gracious in God's sight. In other words, God loves it. It's beautiful to him. And then how we're supposed to do this is we're supposed to mimic Christ in this. Jesus suffered in these ways. And so we follow his example as we do these things. Who, what, why, how, and then we'll apply it. So let's do it. First, who? Servants. Now the word here is not doulos. It's not the word for slave. It's more of a technical term for a, a servant in the household and a servant who is probably actually well-educated and has great responsibility. Think of Joseph in Potiphar's house. He was this kind of servant. One who had authority and delegation within the home and so, sort of a ranking even. And yet, he was a slave, so he was owned by his master. In the Roman world that Peter's writing to, slavery was prevalent. Slavery saturated that society. Some say that without slavery, it, that society could not have existed. The slavery of that day um, could be a brutal thing. Uh, slave owners had full rights over their slaves as property to do what they saw fit, which is a terrible evil. Um, you would end up a slave in the Roman Empire for many reasons, but usually through war pillaging. The kind of the the kind of the reasoning there of <clears throat> slavery after warfare is if you if you were conquered and then your life was spared, the idea was that you owed your life to your captors now and you'd serve it out as a as a slave. So, as barbaric as the Roman slavery was. It does pale in comparison to the sort of slavery we had in our country. <laughs> the hideous, twisted perversion of slavery we had here was far beyond that in its evil and peculiarness, uh, focusing on one people group and, and utter ownership. And we're not even going to get into that. So Roman slavery was different um, than the slavery that we had in this country. And we are so glad that whether in that form or the Roman form, that, that slavery no longer exists, at least in our sector of the world, praise God. 
And praise God for all the Christians who ran that campaign for the abolition of slavery. Um, Peter's going to tell the slaves here to submit, but we want to have a balanced view of this. Um, within the New Testament, we know that slaves are also encouraged, if possible, to obtain their freedom. So anywhere that's possible, that is encouraged by Paul. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And so this is not an ultimate thing. And wherever there are um, like uh, ways to appeal for freedom or justice, as we'll see, we should use those. So, okay, let's just look. Like last week we talked about, he said, honor the emperor. We don't live under an emperor or a king. We live in a democratic republic, uh, constitutional republic, democracy whatever you want to call it. That's what we live in. We don't have a king. Technically, the Constitution is supposed to be the king. Um, and so, as we live that out in our situation, we are to, that's what we saw last week, it's about the attitude of honor and submission to those who are in positions of authority. Understanding that ultimately, God put those people there, whether they're good or evil, it's God who's in control of that. And so we must honor that, even as Jesus spoke respectfully with Pilate. With having said that, <laughs> there are uh, ways in which we can appeal to a just system and thankfully we have we have you know, courts of appeal and ways that we can fight things in this country and the same thing's going to happen in in today's passage regarding the workplace i'm kind of getting ahead of myself but he's let's we'll just keep moving through it okay so servants and classically uh preachers apply this how does this apply to us right none of us are servants and You'll notice in Peter also that he doesn't address uh, masters or slave owners where Paul does that sort of thing. So some Christians were that, but by and large Christians were, were not that. By and large Christians were, were slaves and the poor in Peter's day here, and so most of them were that. But I think the reason that Peter doesn't address the rich or those few that may have been slave owners, because people were getting saved all over the place, um, is because the servants here in their unique situation, it basically pictures the, the, the struggle for every Christian. He's going to apply this broadly here, as we'll see, to every believer who suffers unjustly. And so, classically, this has always been applied to the workplace. And there's a like, likeness there. And so that's how we'll apply it to us here today, that these principles applied directly to us at work and how we're supposed to treat our bosses and etc so okay so that's who what he calls them to be subject it's the same thing he said last time about being subject to those who have governing civil authority and this is not just like fine i'll do it obedience it's a posture and that posture remains even if the emperor must be disobeyed because we must obey God rather than men, even when that happens, if that happens, it happened to Peter, we must do so with a posture of respect. Think of Paul. He was dragged before various rulers of the Roman world, and he always spoke with respect to those guys. doesn't mean he agreed with them. He called them to account, but it was about the vibes. And so that matters so much how we approach things and it's not about bare submission and agreeing with everything and even doing everything but it's about that mentality and the same thing's true here we must put ourselves under subjection to those who have authority over us there's no that's not an undignified thing that's a glorious thing that we ought to do and peter wants us to remember that while we're in this strange land and we're not home yet we don't have to fear, but we can freely submit ourselves to those who have authority. We can do that. And if we do that well, it's actually a very glorious thing. That's what he's going to tell us today. So what he wants servants to do is be subject to masters or those with authority with all respect. Now the word here is fear. And I might have just... Uh, 
stepped in it because last week I talked about how he said, fear God but honor the emperor. He didn't say fear the emperor and we are not to fear the emperor in that way. But here it seems to be possibly saying fear those who have authority. Um, it could also mean fearing God, like do it out of fear for God, which we know is true anyway. Um, but if, if he is telling them to fear those who have authority, I think there's a principle here, like a principle of like concentric circles. So the emperor would be on that farthest circle. But as you move closer to our everyday lives, those who have authority in our everyday lives, in a way, we should be even more careful and more diligent to show that reverence and respect. In the 1999 motion picture ghost dog of course I might have used this one before um, there was a, a wisdom on the wall in the dojo and it said matters of great concern should be treated lightly and that seems confusing and sounds backwards if something's really important and really really, really momentous shouldn't we be really worried about that and then one of the masters commented on it and he said matters of small concern should be treated seriously. And our lives are backwards when we just like worry about the big things out there and we're kind of careless with the everyday things that are always happening. The opposite should be true. If we're faithful in the everyday little things, then when the big stuff comes around, we're going to be we're, we'll be ready for it already. It's not going to be an issue. And so our everyday lives with those that are nearest to us are the most important things that God says we should focus on. And that's important to keep that in mind. You know what I mean? That's what counts. That's what matters. That's how we spend our lives doing that. So, um, yeah, you guys are going to want to watch that movie. I don't forbid that one. So you can watch Ghost Dog. It's all good. Um... But notice what he says. Not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. The good and the gentle, that's all good. And we saw that last week when he talks about rulers, he's in general speaking of the goodness of rulers and when laws are good and governors are good in general. That's great. That's easy. That should be a no-brainer for Christians to submit to. But when a ruler or a governor or an authority in the workplace is evil or not fair, what does he say? Doesn't matter. Same thing. Submit. The word unjust here, I think it's this word, scolios. So crooked is the word. Um, crooked, conniving, unjust, unfair, evil, bosses. Now, just right there, like even in the application to the workplace, we can like put it in context, okay? None of us are slaves. Praise the Lord. If we were slaves in the ancient world, and we were receiving Peter's letter, our bosses would probably be, our masters would probably be not very nice people. And yet we would be commanded to show respect, just as Joseph shows respect to Potiphar, shows respect in the prison. And you notice that respect only blesses him. If slaves did that, it really, at the end of the day, is not a big deal for us Christians to submit to our bosses at work, our overseers, our supervisors, our managers, whatever it may be, it can be done. <laughs> it's a light and easy burden relatively now that doesn't mean it always is okay the injustice like injustice anywhere it stings big small little it hurts when somebody treats you unfairly and especially when that person has some sort of power over you bosses in the workplace have authority that's and that's as it should be you know what's that authority like well you can be disciplined you can be fired and so that authority is genuine from within the company or whatever it is. So when they're unfair, we are supposed to submit. That's what. Okay. Why does he want us to do this? The Bible is so reasonable. He's just going to march us through all his thinking here. So this is in verse um, 19 and 20. Okay. For or because the reason that we should submit 
to even to those who are unjust is because it is a gracious thing. It's a gracious thing. This comes up again later at the end of verse 20. It is a gracious thing in the sight of God. What does that mean? That means that God loves it. That means it is beautiful to Him. It is significant to Him. That means something to God. You know, the impressive things about humans aren't impressive to God. He doesn't care about our athletes. He doesn't care about our rich. He doesn't care about our successful. He doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't care about those who have great authority and pomp. And He doesn't care. Those are small things to him because he has the reality of all those. It's laughable. But what God does care about and what means so much to him is when his people suffer well. And just like our submission is first and foremost a mentality and a disposition, same with our suffering. It is first and foremost a mindset. And he defines that mindset for us. This is a gracious thing when mindful of God. Mindful of God. Uh, you know, Paul talks about the workplace a little differently than this, but in, in Paul's, uh, his treatment, he talks about it as though we do what we do in the workplace and we do it for Christ. We serve Christ as if Christ was our actual boss. You know? Because actually he is our boss's 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 boss. You know, it's Christ. And so the mentality there is, what if Jesus was my boss? How would I work? I would be killing it. You'd be killing it, you know? And Jesus isn't like what we think either. We would expect that harshness of Christ. He's not like that, you know? He's not soft like those medieval pictures of him, but he, he, he's not judgmental over us. He is kind and he is meek. And if Jesus was our boss, we would be the very most encouraged. Like we saw last week, one of the, uh, one of the duties of a ruler is to um, praise those who do good and encourage the good. Christ is full of that. So if Jesus was your boss, work would be awesome. And you would work hard. You'd work freely. You would enjoy that work. Now Jesus is not our boss, okay? So not in that sense. However, it's a mindset. And that's really the same thing here. Mindful of God, the invisible God, our invisible Father, who dwells in our true home. We must be mindful of Him. Doing this is impossible apart from a consciousness of God, an awareness of Him, thinking of Him, knowing what He commands us to do, and knowing what He promises to reward us with. And when that mentality is there, the outward submission is easy. And even bearing with injustice can be done when we're mindful of God. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. See how many times does he own it? He says, it's not fair. It's not fair. And we don't have to pretend that it always is fair. Unfairness happens every day. And when it happens... We can be mindful that it is, and we can also be mindful of what God has called us to do. He calls us to bear with it. He goes on in verse 20, For what credit is it? The word credit here, I, I think it's a, sort of a weak translation. It really, the word means fame or glory. It's something so rowdy that the tale must be told. Something epic. What epicness is it? If you sin and are beaten for it, you endure it. So this would be like you know, corporal punishment, more saturated that world, both in the civil government, you'd be beaten civilly, and then slaves would be beaten as correctives. It's a savage thing. Um, 
you know, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of it. it you know, corporal beating in, in the civil realm may be a better route than our prison system, but that's a whole different discussion, okay? So before we just judge this as ultimately um, undoable, I, I don't know that our present system is any better. In many ways, much worse could be. So, but he, what he, his point is, is if you commit a crime or do something wrong and you have to suffer the consequences, you're not going to get beat in the workplace, praise the Lord, hopefully not, but you might get, you know, demerits or whatever happens. You did some disciplinary action. If that happens because you did something wrong and you, and you bear it, that means nothing. There's no fame in that. Oh, you suffered for what you did. There's no glory there. But, he says, if you do good and suffer for it, and then you endure it. That's the gracious thing in God's sight. That's what means something to God, is when we do good. Now, I think what he's getting at here is that for these believers, a lot of times they would face discipline um, and injustice because of their Christian walk. And that's, that's textbook persecution right there. And that may happen. That will happen to us through our lives in one way or another. That because of our commitment to Christ and His truth, people will persecute us. And sometimes that could happen with someone who has authority over us. Right? When that happens, and we stand our ground and we endure it. It doesn't mean like you don't go to HR if something happened that's wrong. Praise the Lord. There's workers' rights. We should use all those avenues of rights that are afforded within the systems we're in. Praise God. So we should feel free in doing all that. But even while we do that and we suffer, we can bear it well. An example like in the civil realm would be if, if there was an unjust arrest that happened. What would be the course of action? Well, you don't fight the arrest on the spot. But you would have to subsequently fight it in court. And it's the same mentality here. So even if we can, he's not saying don't use the rights you have, but he's saying the mentality and the disposition within it should be this, bearing the injustice. You know, like if someone takes one to the chin and they, 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 you know, they eat it. You eat it, you just take it, you know? So uh, there's a similar thing here. Charles Spurgeon says this on it. Um, we are to be like the anvil. Let others strike us if they will, but we shall wear out their hammers if we only know how to stand still and bear all that is put upon us. So our job is to do nothing but to stand and to remain and to carry that burden, mindful of God who will always do what is right. And when you do that, you're different. We're different than other people when that happens. And that just opens doors for the gospel. But that's not his point here yet. His point here is that if no one else sees it or cares about it, God loves it. It's beautiful to him. It is a glory and renown in the heavenly realms before the throne of our majestic God. It's a sweet savor unto him when we do that. And that should be enough for us to suffer any number of injustices while entrusting ourselves to a faithful God. Okay, last question, how? How does he want us to do this? Well, this is verse 21. And this really pivots into the next section, but I didn't want to do today's sermon without it. For to this you have been called. Boom, stop there. According to the Apostle Peter, this is the call of the Christian life, to suffer injustice well. To suffer it well. When you think about the hideous form of slavery in our country, and you think about the black community, suffering that so well. Like the original forms of American music, blues, jazz, all the way to the present day, and all the popular forms of music, all that flows out of the suffering of the black community. That's such a great example of bearing well with suffering that we have in our own culture. Praise the Lord for that. It can be done. And it ought to be done by Christians everywhere. 
To this you have been called. It's not a strange thing when it happens. It's a normal thing when it happens for Christians. Because Christ also suffered for you. Leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Um, so dope here. So he's about to launch into this other section of glorious Christology. That's next week's sermon. I just couldn't do it all today. It's too awesome. But he's getting there here because he mentions Christ's suffering for us. Now, there's two things going on here, okay? Some people think about, like, Christ. What is Christ? What, a lot of people think that the whole purpose of Jesus' life and death was to set us an example that we should imitate. And some people's idea of Christ is just that. That certainly is true, as Peter says. But the first thing he says here is very important. He said, Christ suffered for you. The word for there, it means in our place or instead of us. It means he substituted in for us. You know, like on Nacho Libre, tag me when Escalito had enough. Christ tagged in and took that suffering for us. And that suffering is unique. That is the whole other part of Christ's suffering. He didn't just die to set us an example. Not first and foremost, he died to pay for our sins. He died to make us clean and set us free and make us God's children once again. <laughs> you know, so that substitutionary death of Christ is what he's talking about here. And that's the main thing and the first thing and the ultimate thing about Christ's suffering. And in that way, praise the Lord, we never have to suffer like that. We never will. The believer never has to pay for any of their sin, not even one drop of sin will we ever pay for because Christ paid it all. That's what that means. But Peter's a G with it, and he can still see ways to use this. Christ suffered on the cross as an example for us. Even though he died for us, there's also an example there. And the example there is suffering unjustly. Christ suffered for us unjustly related to the human actors in the crucifixion. Related to God, he gave himself up freely and took our burdens upon him. And in that way, he was satisfying justice. But when it came to those who betrayed him and those who crucified him and handed him over, those who beat him and mocked him and nailed him to the tree and cast lots over his garments, those people, it was un unjust. And he suffered that well. So in this, what he's talking about is we can get our cues from the way Christ interacted with the people around him. Pilate, all them. That whole vibe is how we're supposed to do it. It says he left us an example that we might follow in his steps. The idea here is like when, when you learn to write or, and you had to trace out the letters. You know the piece of paper? It's got the dotted letters. And as we're kids, you trace the lines. Trace the lines. You've got to do that. It's, that's disciplinary work. That's the idea here. And it really isn't pretty easy stroke there. The, the, the line is a simple one. And that line is this. When injustice happens to us, let's bear it well. That's the line that we trace. We don't pay for our sins before God. We can't control everything. And we can certainly like appeal with our rights within our systems. All, that's awesome. But our attitude and our demeanor, we trace that line, we bear with it, we're not surprised by it, be the anvil upon which their hammers are worn out. It's a good word. So, and next week he's going to launch into that. It's awesome. So let's, um, let's just try to apply this real quick, and we'll be through. Three applications today. First, let's submit to and honor those who are over us in the workplace. Not an easy thing to do always. And yet when we do it, we stand out as different. When we do it, the fragrance of Christ is upon us. When we bear injustice well, we can be an encouragement to those around us who are also suffering injustice. Let's be different. You know, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, all that. So, dare to be different. <laughs> and it's an attitude. And it doesn't mean the person's right. If we are not able to submit to people that are sinful and imperfect, then we are never ready to have authority ourselves. Not until you go through it. Think of Joseph again. This is all Joseph here. Joseph submitted to all that graciously. And he became the ruler of Egypt. 
But if he had just sat on the throne without that, he would be a bad ruler. We have authority. We will be given authority over the nations, over angels. We will judge. We will sit on thrones over the universe and reign forever and ever with Christ. But for now, he wants us to train. For now, he wants us to show that we know how to submit. We know how to do it. And when we show that we know how to do it, God may honor us with authority as well because we'll know how to handle it then and we'll be sensitive to those under us. So let's do that. Let's do that. Let's be the very best employees we could be as if Jesus was our actual boss. That's the only way. Doesn't mean everything's going to go well, but it's different when we do that. And that's all he's asking us to do. He will take care of all the results. Second application. Let's seek these special deeds of renown before God. The fame and the glory of suffering well. That's next level. That, you know, you watch the action movies and everything's epic and you take over. But in real life, the true epicness is when we suffer well. When our shoulders are broad enough and our spiritual muscles are strong enough to take it. To walk with that burden. And you know, it, let's admit it. It's a much better burden than the burden of our sin we carry. That's the insufferable burden. The burden of the guilt and shame of our sin that Jesus took off. That's the burden we could never carry. These little burdens can be done. Can be done. Let's seek those deeds of renown. Let's encourage each other. If you have the opportunity to suffer in the workplace unjustly, whether or not it's for being a Christian, but especially if it is, but even if it's just for doing right, let's encourage each other. That's an opportunity. That's a privilege not everybody gets. Because there the glories of God will shine. Okay, third and last. Let's much consider the original of our calling or the pattern we have in Christ. We can't do this well unless we're mindful of Christ, meditating on Christ, thinking often of His death and suffering, filling our hearts with His words. Having Christ before us is the only thing that will allow us to do this well. So our real job is just to get as much of Christ as we can. Love Christ. Be loved by Him. Enjoy the sweetness of fellowship with your amazing Lord who's done all this for you and me. And when we consider that pattern, we'll find ourselves walking in it as well. Praise the Lord. If anyone here today is carrying that truly miserable and insufferable burden of the guilt of sin, you must know that right now, where you sit, that burden can be rolled away forever by trusting in Jesus who died for sins. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth and we pray that you would bless it to build us up and give us true wisdom that we would be a different kind of people and that your glory would shine forth. Pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.